the last four or five weeks, we spoke about some topics dealing with covenants in your Bible. And we tried to go back to learn the lessons that the covenants would teach us, even though we are not the participants in those covenants. Uh, we're not the nation of Israel. Uh, we're not David. Uh, we are not Abram. And so we do not have the same promises and covenants that God gave them. And yet they're in the Bible. And Paul says all scriptures for our learning. And there are important things that we learn from the covenants that are different than the actual promise themselves. For example, Abraham was promised a son. You're not promised a son. But we learn from God's covenant with him that you can be justified by faith because Abram just believed without works and God counted it to him for righteousness. So we can learn lessons like that. Uh, David, for example, was promised again a son that would be a king over Israel forever. And though you weren't promised a son that'd be king over Israel forever, uh, we can learn from David what it's like to have sure mercy because that promise included in it a sure promise of forgiveness no matter what sin occurred in his family. And so we, we talk about grace or certain mercies. So these are the lessons we've been dealing with in detail the last four or five weeks. This morning I'd like to deal with a chart that brings together uh, the mysteries and covenants in the Bible and tries to, to illustrate how they're connected. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, we learn to rightly divide perhaps, about the way churches have communicated the scripture, maybe in your past, which concerns a covenant everywhere and always, and you're under a covenant all the time. The dispensational idea is that God doesn't always deal with everybody under a covenant. There's these dispensations and grace that he provides that creates a new creature. That means you're not under Israel's covenants, but he's still dealing with humanity according to his purpose. So how do we reconcile these, these mysteries and these dispensations that God gives and the covenants he gives to Israel? Well, we'll start with the New Testament books. The New Testament books of the Bible fulfill the promises of the Old Testament. This is clear and understood and accepted by uh, most majority of Christians. The New Testament fulfills the Old Testament promises. You see that kind of structure in the scripture. And so when you look at the New Testament of your Bible, you see the 12 apostles... And Peter, James, and John wrote epistles. They wrote gospels, right? Matthew was one of the, the apostles. Uh, John was one of the apostles. We have J uh, James writing an epistle. We have Peter writing a couple. John writing three plus Revelation. Jude was one of the apostles. So you have the 12 apostles here. <clears throat> make that a little more legible here. Let's make the 12. And we have these books that detail the coming kingdom to Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John begin in the New Testament detailing the gospel of the kingdom that was preached by Jesus and his disciples. And so his disciples carried on that, that program. So we have books written by the Twelve about a kingdom. And we read in these New Testament fulfillments, allusions to the Old Testament covenants. This is what we've been teaching about. For example, a covenant was made with David. And we can draw David back here. In the Old Testament. And a covenant was made with David that he would have a seed like the son of David. And we dealt with that. The son of David would be the Messiah, would be the king over Israel. And his kingdom would last forever. And we see this covenant promise to David fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes. And the 12 apostles preach Jesus, as Matthew 1, 1 says, as the son of David. And here's Jesus at the center of the Old New Testament fulfillment. Covenant given to David. We have a covenant given to Moses. Let's draw Moses back here. This is Old Testament law. He walks down off of Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And this covenant was a law in order to bless Israel if they kept it, or a law to curse Israel or their enemies. It, it taught them proper judgment. right? So it talked about uh, a blessing that would come from Israel when they kept it, and it taught them how to judge right and wrong. It also was a law that defined that nation of Israel. Moses, we covered a couple weeks ago, the law of Moses, spoke to and foreshadowed the coming of one that would be the judge over Israel, and that would be the source of blessing over Israel. And so we have this covenant given to Moses, again, kind of fulfilled by Jesus at the center. Jesus came teaching the law, the 12 disciples came teaching the law, and how Jesus said in Matthew 5, I do not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. A covenant, that law was supposed to speak of and point to Jesus Christ. So the ministry of Christ and the Twelve dealt with Moses' law as well. We have the covenant given to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the covenant back there to the fathers was about a land and a seed and a blessing. 
Uh, they promised once again a seed that would come from these men, Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob's seed, which would be the 12 tribes of Israel. So if we draw the fathers over here, this covenant that would separate a certain people, a circumcised people. Remember, Abraham was told to circumcise his son, then Isaac, and then Jacob, and he had a 12-tribe nation. This promise of a circumcised nation of people is fulfilled over here with the 12 apostles preaching about a coming kingdom. They're preaching about a kingdom come that was promised since the fathers. Jesus, in Romans 15, 8, it said about him, he was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers for the truth of God. Well, that goes all the way back to the fathers. That goes beyond Moses. So he's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. He fulfills the law of Moses. All these covenants then speak to this ministry that Jesus had with the 12 apostles. We have a covenant with Abram. We covered this briefly. Abram back here was given a promise before he was told to circumcise his son, before he was told to do anything. Just a promise, I'll give you a seed, a son, without condition. And Abraham believed him, and it was counted for righteousness. So he was promised a seed, and along with that seed, the seed in Abraham himself would be a blessing to the world. So the promise that Abram and his seed would bless the entire world. We see this fulfilled once again with Jesus at the center. Jesus is the son of Abraham, right? Through him, the world gets blessed, right? Yes, fulfillment of covenants. That's what we're talking about. And then, of course, we covered last week Adam. Adam was the first man at the beginning of the world when God created the world. And to Adam, he was promised, well, Adam and Eve there, after they sinned, there was a promise God made about a coming seed. We see a theme here. Seed, 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 seed. God keeps promising the seed. He promised Adam and Eve when they sinned that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of Satan, remember? And Satan would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Genesis 3, verse 15. And so this promise from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 of the Bible prophesied the need for a coming man, right, that would destroy the devil. Where is Satan destroyed? We read in Revelation 20, Christ uh, throws him into the lake of fire binds him up for a thousand years, then ultimately gets rid of him forever. So we have this, this battle between God and the devil over humanity and the earth, and to Adam and Eve he said the seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan, and that kingdom will fulfill that, Christ being the king. So again, Satan, Jesus comes, and he says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Jesus casts out the devils. Why is he doing this? Because that's what was promised back to Adam, fulfill this kingdom, destroy the head of Satan. Right? His power over people of death and, and all that. These are the covenants in the Bible. Going from the beginning of the world to Revelation, which talks about this kingdom come, the end of the world. And this is how Christians see the scripture. They see these covenants in the Old Testament. They see them fulfilled in the New Testament with Christ in the middle, like he fulfills them. So the whole scripture speaks about Jesus Christ. Right? And thus they call this Christocentricity, right? Christ, the center of the Bible is Christ, Christocentric. Look, covenant theologians like to talk about that. They're Christ-centric. They don't focus on other things like nations of Israel. They're Christ in the center. And this is why they get that, because Christ fulfills all these covenants. And the ministry of the New Testament communicates this. Right. These covenants, notice as I drew the illustration here, all seem to point to one nation and one one nation through the fathers, one nation through Moses, one house through David. As we get more and more covenants in the scripture, it gets more specific. Adam just said a seed of a woman. Well, how many seed of a woman has there been? Well, a lot of people have been progeny from Adam and Eve, right? Well, then Abram, he calls this one man out and says, through you. And not just through Abram, but Isaac and Jacob. Well, that's really narrowing it down where this seed's going to come from. And then Moses, there's a nation, one nation of people. And then David, in your house will come the Messiah. And so when Jesus comes, Matthew 1, 1 begins, he's the son of David, the son of Moses. All these covenants speak to this one seed, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So when Jesus says, search the scriptures, they speak of me. You see what he's talking about? All the covenants and prophecies were pointing to him, the need for him. In order for this to happen, he had to come. That's what the Bible teaches. This is the covenant gospel. These covenants point to one nation, one family, one man. Jesus Christ. Okay. These covenant gospels, and if you, were to, if you were to preach a good news about the covenants, you know, the covenants themselves are good in that when God gives you a promise, you, you, you rejoice. 
But the good news happens when the covenants start getting fulfilled, right? The promise God made, he's going to deliver on it. That's when you're like, okay, let's preach that. That's good news. And this is what happens in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus comes. They preach the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. What does that mean? All of these covenants are going to be fulfilled. That's what that means. And he's the one that's going to do it. Well, that's really good news for God's purpose and plan. But it all depends on Jesus and his working out his covenants to the fathers. So the covenant gospel then would include the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, all these covenants were promised a seed. You had a seed from Adam, a seed from Abraham, or a seed of the woman, a seed from Abraham, a seed from Isaac and Jacob, uh, an Israelite who is the son of David. Well, who, who is this seed? Jesus. But they didn't know his name. So one major point of Matthew, Luke, and John is the preaching of the gospel of the name of Jesus, Christ, Jesus, who is the promised Christ, the promised Messiah. The word Christ or Messiah means Savior, Jesus is the one identifying who is that Savior. So the covenant gospel is the gospel of the name of Jesus, because that's what all the covenants point to, a certain man, one man. They prophesy about it. It also points to the kingdom. So you call this the gospel of the kingdom, because it's the good news of that fulfillment. It's also a gospel to Israel, because, again, God promised a nation would bless the other nations. The kingdom on earth would get fulfilled. Here's the world through one nation blessing the other nations. And so that one nation is the nation Israel, Christ is king. So it's a good news to Israel as well. So when Jesus came in Matthew chapter 5, for example, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he chose 12 guys as his disciples, his apostles, and said, do not go to the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why would he say this? Because the covenant said that the world would be blessed through a nation, right? through the one people. So Jesus Christ is at the center of these covenants and promises. And this is where people get the idea that there's only one gospel. Right? Because they all point to Jesus. It's his name. It's his kingdom. It's one nation, one family. There's one gospel, right? I mean, if the covenants are fulfilled, that's the gospel, fulfilling the covenants. But what if God doesn't always operate through covenants? You see the issue? And so if all the covenants is all we had in the scripture then the one message is fulfilling the covenants. Jesus Christ fulfills them. But what if there's something in the Bible that does not concern the covenants given to the fathers that was kept secret since the beginning of the world that doesn't concern the kingdom or Israel, 12 tribes? Would that be a different message? Maybe a different good news, you see? And this is what we talk about when we talk about the revelation of the mystery. The Bible speaks about revealed mysteries. In fact, each one of these additional covenants and prophecies add more information to describe how God's going to fulfill his purpose for history. So there's revealed mysteries. For example, the nation of Israel and those laws were not revealed to Abraham or Adam. The house of David, the son of David, that promise that the Messiah would come from David wasn't given to Moses or Abraham. So there's, there's revealed mysteries in the covenant program. And they all reveal things about how God's going to fulfill this program. Jesus Christ is pointing to him, right? It's pointing to the kingdom. Look at Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, or Hebrews chapter 8, rather. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. Hebrews 8, 13. Realizing this point can help us with some very complicated ideas, just realizing these covenants are fulfilled in Jesus and the purpose of these covenants and what they do. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews is a book describing the New Testament, the New Covenant, right? And Hebrews chapter 8 talks about this New Covenant that's going to replace this old one. He quotes Jeremiah 31, and Jeremiah the prophet says, I'm going to make a covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel, that, different than the one that I made with them through Moses, right? I'm going to make another one, and I'm going to forgive their sins, and I'll, I'll fulfill my covenants with them. Hebrews 8 verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant he hath made the first one old. Now that which decays and wax old is ready to vanish away. This idea of the Old Covenant or Old Testament comes from Hebrews, comes from the New Testament portion of your Bible that looks back and says, there's one of these covenants that's old and it's going to go away. What doesn't go away are the covenants God says last forever. David's covenant, for example, said the kingdom would last how long? Forever. It doesn't go away. 
to the fathers of Israel, multiple times in the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God says, forever I'll give it to you and your seed. Circumcise your son, he told Abraham, and I'll, make you, I'll give you a land forever, a nation forever. To Adam, I mean, you bruise the head of somebody, that's not just like you got a bruise on your forehead, it's like you crush their head, right? And so they're done. Do they come back from that? No. Like, they're done forever. Like, you, you bruise someone's heel, you come back from that. Not their head. Okay? So you have a lot of forever promises here, through the fathers and David and Adam. But Moses' covenant was never said to be forever. In fact, there was an inherent problem in it. The problem was not with God. The problem was with man. Man couldn't keep the law. Israel couldn't keep it. And so Hebrews describes this and says, well, the law of Moses was going to vanish away, replaced by this new covenant. And so you can see how this law here could not last forever and was going to be replaced by something new. A new covenant. This new covenant would be to the same people, the fathers of Israel, right? It would help accomplish what Jesus would perform, or Jesus would actually help accomplish the new covenant, in order for this salvation to occur over here, this kingdom to be established, the forgiveness to be worldwide and blessing to, to be given. So you see where the new covenant fits in. It replaces this covenant. Jesus comes fulfilling the law so that he can bring in a new covenant. Hebrews 8, Jeremiah 31 says, to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the same people that the old covenant was made with. All right? The old covenant could not accomplish what God wanted to do forever in Israel. The new covenant can. And so you see some mysteries revealed, the new covenant being one of them. I mean, the new covenant wasn't something that he talked about to Abraham. Abraham didn't even know the old one. He didn't even talk about the new covenant in detail to Moses. You can find the new covenant promise inherent in the law. But the main thing in Moses' books is, do the law, this is the covenant, it's what you should do. Inside the curses was, well, if you keep breaking my law, eventually I'm going to punish you to a point where you're almost going to be gone. But I'll remember the promises I made to the fathers. Remember that? And so he'll remember it. And that's that allusion to, I'm going to do something to fix this problem so that I keep the promises here. This helps you, hopefully this illustration helps you with Galatians as well. Galatians says, if there was a law that could save, Moses' law was a good law. God gave it, but the law could never save. Which begs the question, if the law could not be fulfilled, then how can God fulfill the covenant to the fathers? It depended on that, right? So God has to replace it so that he can keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why he has to replace that law with a new covenant. We'll see here in a bit that to say you're under the new covenant is really going to cause problems for you. Now, saying that outside of our illustration here, you might say, well, yeah, why is that? But as I'm drawing covenants about an earthly kingdom that's point, point to an earthly Messiah over a nation of Israel and one people and 12 tribes, you might see how this is an issue. If you're under the new covenant, what's that put you under? Moses' law, David's covenant, a kingdom and a house forever over in Israel. What if you're not Israel? What if you don't have a house forever? What if you're not one of the 12 tribes? What if you were never given a law in the first place? You were never given a law that needed to replace. You didn't have a law. So what's the deal there? Well, we'll see this in a little bit here. Look, look at Matthew 13, 11. Jesus, when he came, he spoke about things like this. God reveals secret things throughout the scripture. Some people point to this fact to discount the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. They'll say, well, Paul is just speaking about one of many mysteries that the Bible reveals as God reveals his will. But it's something greater than that, as we'll see. Matthew 13, 11, Jesus is preaching here in his parables and his teaching, and his disciples ask why he speaks unto the crowd in parables. I mean, parables are hard to understand. They are not, as many preachers have falsely assumed, illustrations to make teachings easier. They're not that. Parables intentionally make things harder, like a riddle. Okay. Now, if you know the key to the riddle, then you can get some information. But if you don't know the key, it will hide information from you. And that's a, precisely what the parables were. He spoke in parables. People went away and said, good sermon, Pastor, but didn't know what he's talking about. His disciples, who trusted he was the Messiah, said, what does that mean? And his disciple, he told his disciples what it was, gave them the key to understanding it. So he, they asked him, why are you speaking parables? Why are you making it hard for them? Right. He says in verse 11, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, believing disciples, 12 apostles here, given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. That's interesting. 
So you see, as God reveals more information, even in his own ministry, he separates these 12 and says, you are going to understand about the mysteries of the kingdom, but the rest of Israel will not. If they do not believe me, do not follow me, they will not get this. And so any more details about the kingdom, I'm not given to all of Israel. I'm given to those who follow me, the disciples that are following Jesus. They get mysteries of the kingdom. Now, there are mysteries here. You can read about those. Mysteries, details, information, revelation that God gives about the kingdom that was not known before. But what's the mystery about? A kingdom that was promised before, that was covenanted. Who does he give it to? Twelve disciples. His disciples in Israel, which was promised, would be a nation forever. Right? So these mysteries in the Bible reveal things according to God's purpose. Look at Deuteronomy 29. The law of Moses. God told Moses that uh, there'd be secret things that he would have. And the things that are secret are God's. And the things that are revealed are for people to know. People interpret that verse and say, well, God works in mysterious ways. And there are many things we do not understand about God. <laughs> so there's a truth to the statement that the things we know about God is what he has revealed in his word. And if you try to say things about God that his word does not say, you are escaping the bounds of your knowledge about God. In 29, in verse 29, people want to claim they have special visions and revelations, like Paul did. They're not Paul. They're not Peter. They're not, you're, not prof, you're not a prophet. Okay? God has closed this book, and it has, as we'll see here, everything we need to know. We've already seen the covenants promised, covenants fulfilled, and then we'll see some more here where Paul says he fulfills the word of God. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. It says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. Question, who is the us in this verse? Deuteronomy is directly speaking to the nation of Israel entering the promised land. Israel was given the promises of God. In Romans chapter 9, verse 4, Paul says specifically that Israel was given the adoption and the glory and the sonship and the, and the laws and, and to whom Christ came. Right? The revelations, the oracles of God were given to Israel. What advantage has the Jew, Paul asked? He said, much every way. It's much better to get revelations from God than not get revelations from God. And Israel was given revelations from God. So, you see, there were mysteries, revelations, things that were no longer secret. He's revealing to these people. And the content of them speak to a coming seed, a coming Savior, a coming nation and kingdom that would reign in dominion over the earth. That was the content of these revelations. More details being revealed. Notice also, Paul, or not Paul, but Moses here says that the secret things belong to God. So there's some secret things up here that God keeps, right? And down here is what we see he's revealed to Israel, specifically. Right? This is the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And Deuteronomy 29 says if he's revealed them, they're to us, to Israel, and our children. He says our children because when God says a promise, he has to fulfill them. Here are the fathers. Here are the children. Right? The given of the promise, the fulfillment of the promises. So the scripture speaks of this. But the secret things are God's. If God hasn't told us, hasn't told them, it's not for them. You might see where I'm going here with this a little bit. Because in the scripture, I drew on the board here the Old Testament. We got the law, we got the prophets, we got the Psalms here with David. We've got the New Testament with Jesus' is coming there and the 12 disciples and the kingdom and all those epistles. But we're missing something, which is 13 epistles given to Paul. He doesn't talk about the kingdom to Israel. He's not one of the 12. But here we have this apostle. We'll draw him over here. The Apostle Paul, he's got 13 epistles in the, in the New Testament portion of your Bible. Right? He's not talking about the content of these covenant promises. Let's cover a few verses just to remind ourselves of that. They're not written by the 12 apostles. Paul was not one of the 12. Peter, James, and John had their own epistles. Paul had separate ones. His epistles are not written about the name of Jesus, though he mentions Jesus as the Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ quite often. That's not the... New revelation in his epistles. He's not talking about the name being a new thing. He's not talking about Israel as a nation either. In fact, he says in many epistles, there's no Jew or Gentile. He says outright in Romans 11, Israel's fallen. Well, then Paul, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises? No, he's not. Well, if you're not talking about the Old Testament fulfillment of those Old Testament promises, then what are you talking about? Right? 
People lump him in with other New Testament books, but he's talking about something different. Look at Romans 16.25, or just remember it. It's a verse we often quote here. And uh, I want to bring to our attention in the, in the light of our study today this idea that it's kept secret since the world began. Paul says, Now to him it is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now wait a minute. We've already seen how all the covenants point to Jesus. He is the seed, the holy seed, right? From, from the seed of the woman to Abram's seed, to the seed of Isaac and Jacob, to the seed, the seed through David, he was the promised one, right? But here's Paul saying, I preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Well, wait a minute. Where's the mystery here? Well, people will make that. If you ever wonder what other non-dispensationalists make that verse, like coming to the Lotus, they'll say Paul is talking about the revelation of the name of Jesus and how he was manifest in the flesh. But that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about. Paul's talking about something else beyond this, as we'll see. But he says this preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began. Now, Adam was pretty close to the beginning of the world. Now, Paul's talking about what did he say? It was kept secret? Oh, he's talking about secret things before the world began, revealed to the Apostle Paul. Right? The revelation of what was secret. He said, you're being real simple and redundant. Yes, i got to make this clear because this is before the world. It was not something that was promised before and he's giving more information about like the mysteries of a kingdom. Well, they all knew what the kingdom was. They wanted to know what those secrets were about the kingdom. Paul says, it's Jesus Christ, according to the mystery, kept secrets as the world began. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Paul calls the mystery the hidden wisdom. Maybe we should erase this word secret because it's revealed now. And what we'll call it is what the scripture calls it, a mystery of Christ that was kept secret since the world began. So it's not just a mystery. It's a mystery of Christ, kept secret since the world began. So apparently there's a way to preach Jesus that the prophets did not directly speak at or did not reveal. They pointed at Jesus. They pointed at what he did in Matthew, Mark, and John, what he would do to accomplish his kingdom. But there's something about Jesus Christ that was kept secret. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, I've got to show some verses to you to communicate the idea that what Paul was given in this revelation was not simply a continuation of the covenant promises, but was something beyond it, greater than it. It wasn't within it, okay? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, God made known unto us the mystery of his will. Apparently, God's will, his purpose for all, all, all things was not yet revealed. Now, that, that's a bold statement when we realize that God had already covenanted a kingdom through a nation and a people and a Messiah to bless the whole world. That seems pretty complete. I mean, the whole world's going to get blessed through a kingdom and a nation and a king. But question, what about the heaven? What about Satan? What about people's sins and reconciliation? You know, what about everyone who's not a Jew? Well, that is interesting. In Ephesians chapter 1, there's the mystery of his will that's made known according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things. Like the fullness of times. Well, maybe that's talking about the kingdom, people say. Or it could be talking about when the times are full. Like the kingdom happens at a certain time. But like what about at the very, very end of time? Most Christians, and when they speak about the end times, what are they speaking about? Right there. What are the signs of the coming kingdom? Right? But you know Revelation does reveal to you that there's a kingdom that lasts a thousand years, and then there's time after the thousand years. Right? So if you're at the beginning of the thousand years, is the time filled up yet? No. There's still time. But the fullness of time means everything that was proper, all the time has been full. Right? So Paul says the dispensation of the fullness of time, his will here, is that he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Well, we know all things are going to be in Christ. But what's he say? Both which are in heaven and on earth. Well, that's interesting because here this Christ was talking about an earthly dominion and an earthly blessing and earthly salvation. 
And Paul says, earth and heaven. Well, that seems to go a little beyond just the earth, right? This revelation to Paul exceeds just the earthly dominion. It encompasses heavenly places. Okay, so you see how this revelation is beyond. It's not confined by one house, one nation, one earth, but the universe, right? Let's move on here to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, and don't mistake this, as Christ chose the twelve, Jesus Christ chose the apostle Paul. Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ, but not according to his earthly ministry. Jesus Christ resurrected in glory, is how Paul got, became an apostle. In Ephesians 3 verse 2 says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you word. Now we covered some four lessons ago. There's between a covenant and a dispensation, where a covenant is made with somebody. A covenant is made because it's a promise to a person about a certain thing. So you have to make a promise to someone. Right? So you need another party and you make it. Uh, and you have to keep that covenant, else it's not a covenant. I mean, you make the promise, then you have to keep the thing. It's an obligation. But if you just give someone something, there's no covenant there. It's a gift. It's a given. And a dispensation is something given, not made with somebody. A covenant is something God makes with someone. So he picks Abram, makes a covenant with him. He picks Isaac, makes a covenant with him. Chooses Moses, makes a covenant with him. And chooses Israel, and then David, makes a covenant with them. There's Jesus Christ, gives him a better covenant, makes a covenant with him. Right? But a dispensation is something God just gives. This, Paul says, there's this dispensation of the grace of God given to me, to you. You're not entering a covenant here. There's something that was given to Paul. Paul says, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. Apparently, this thing given is a revelation, is information about something concerning Christ. He says in verse 4, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So there's new information about Jesus Christ given to Paul. It's not an additional covenant. It's just, here you go. That'd be nice to know. In fact, you don't have a complete Bible without that information, right? If all the covenants of the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament without Paul's epistles, you don't have a complete, complete Bible. You don't have all there is to know about Jesus revealed. Jesus said, I gave a dispensation to Paul about me, which in other ages, in verse 5, was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Christ was promised. Okay. What was not covenanted or prophesied is that God would make something called a new creature or a new man that in one body, Jew and Gentile, would be blessed with salvation through the gospel of grace. Okay, Ephesians 3, verse 6. That was not a part of any of these covenant promises. And that does not fulfill the earthly kingdom promised to Israel. Right? That's something else God's doing. Presumably distinct from these earthly covenants. In fact, Paul says it's a heavenly thing. Right? But what this does is reveals God's manifold wisdom for heaven and earth, for everybody at all time. Okay? The mystery of his will. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 down in verse 8. He says... He is the minister of Christ unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. This fellowship in a kingdom was not a mystery. The fact that there be a nation that would bless all the nations of the world, and in him all the nations of the world be blessed, was not a mystery. Okay, the fact that you'd be a Gentile to get blessed by one of Abraham's seed was not a mystery. Your fellowship with Jesus Christ doesn't concern your relationship to the promised seed and circumcised people. Your relationship to Jesus, your fellowship with him, concerns you being a member of one body. What if I'm a Gentile? Doesn't matter. What if I'm a Jew? Doesn't matter. What if I'm circumcised? Doesn't matter. What if I don't keep the law? Doesn't matter. That's a different fellowship, right, than what God was establishing here. The fellowship of Israel and his kingdom on the earth. The kingdom of God come. So Ephesians 3, verse 9, to make all men see this, look what he says, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. 
The beginning of the world was not Moses, it was not Abraham, it was not even Adam, it was before Adam. Before the world began, God had a purpose about Christ, which everything will be brought together in Him. He kept it secret, which means it wasn't Israel's. And then He started revealing something He'd do for the earth that points to one man that would be the king over all the earth, that would be a savior of all the earth and dominion over all the earth. And then He reveals in a mystery that that one man is actually the key to salvation everywhere. Do you see how that fits into God purposing it before the world began? Like if you've got to purpose it and you've got an adversary, you don't reveal your big plan. What you reveal is not the big plan. What you reveal is like, this, it's not the secondary plan, it's just like something else. In fact, you might even misdirect. Law of Moses, do these laws, I'll bless you. Misdirection. He's not even going to bless Israel by those laws, he's going to bless them freely too. Right? This mystery revelation surpasses all the covenants he gave to Israel. We learn from these covenants. In fact, knowing God's manifold wisdom, as Paul says in Ephesians 3, verse, verse 10, let's move on here. He gave this mystery to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom. Okay. It's manifest. It has different aspects to it, but now it's revealed. So if it's revealed, is it secret anymore? No. And who did he reveal it to? Israel? Nope. He gave it to Paul to give to Gentiles. Well, I thought the secret things belonged to Israel. The secret things regarding the covenants, but not that, right? That was given to Paul to give to the world, for all men. So Ephesians 3, verse 10, the manifold wisdom, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 11. Paul's talking about an eternal purpose. This is not just a new aspect of the kingdom they didn't know yet. Like Jesus said, well, guess what? I am the king, and I'm going to bring the kingdom, but I'm going to come back again. I'm going to leave, go to heaven, come back again. Well, that's something you couldn't really figure out in the prophets. It's like, you're going to come back twice, okay. But it's all about this kingdom. But Paul's saying, no, 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 I'm talking about an eternal purpose, something bigger than just one nation on earth. Okay? Eternity doesn't begin with Adam. Like, it goes back before the world. In the beginning. What was before the beginning? Answer, eternity. <laughs> it's like God, that was it. And so, this is an eternal purpose. Something God had purposed. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Do you see how when Paul explains this information he's been given, it's not just additional information in line with what the prophet said. It was kept secret, and it's greater information than what has ever been known before. It's the key to understanding God's purpose for all time. Colossians 1.25. Now, this may sound very grandiose, but this is the time in which we live. This is the dispensation in which we live, Colossians 1.25. That's why we, we, we revere Okay, we hold sacred, we call holy the Word of God in this book. Okay, it's, it's, not because, it's because it's not just in scrolls anymore, in caves in a temple. It is inspired from the beginning to the end about all time, above all things, telling us God's eternal purpose. And thus, this book is holy. Okay. There's things we can learn that we can't learn anywhere else from this. Colossians 125, Paul says, I am made a minister... Uh, for the church's sake, I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. He doesn't say he made a covenant with me. There's no covenant given to Paul. He doesn't put you in a covenant. There's a dispensation given to him. A dispensation, a giving of a revelation about Jesus Christ and what he's doing. But he says, it was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. You see what he said there? Fulfill the word of God? Now, he's not talking there about fulfilling some promise that was given to the covenants. He's talking about completing the manifold wisdom of God. You see, the earthly covenants without God's hidden purpose is incomplete, right? But when you reveal his hidden purpose from eternity past, from before the world, in addition to the covenant revelations, you now have the full word of God. You have a completed understanding of God's wisdom for the ages. Like I said before, if you take Paul's epistles out, you don't have that. Thus, Paul says, it was, this was given to him to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, what fulfills it? Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages from generations. Ages is time and generations is people. That means it was hidden from all time and people. But now is made manifest to his saints. What a privilege. 
This concerns verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It doesn't concern Christ in a covenant or Christ the promised seed, but Christ in you. Well, point to the covenant that talked about that, like in you Gentiles, in a body. No longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile. This kingdom is established on the distinction of Israel and the Gentiles. Not this. Not this mystery of Christ. This brings everything together. Now there's a unity that everyone will have on Christ alone. You hear songs written about that. This is a Pauline idea. Yes, the covenants point to Christ, but Christ above all is what was revealed in the mystery. Look at 2 Timothy 1. I'm hope, I know this is a little, a little different chart this morning, but I'm hoping to show you how all the Scripture comes together. We as dispensationalists, we who preach Christ according to the mystery, do not discount the covenant promises. Do not say we don't need this. It's not just that's not for us. It's the Bible. It's God's holy word. But we need to see the relationship of how what God revealed to our apostle and who he made us fits in with what he's doing for all time. Okay? How, what we can learn from all Scripture. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Paul says that... He, uh, he's preaching the gospel here, the power of God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, if that's where he stops with salvation and a holy calling, that can just as easily apply to Israel. They had a holy calling. God promised to them salvation and that through Jesus Christ. But look what he says. Not according to our works. That discounts the law of Moses, doesn't it? That discounts the circumcision, doesn't it? Right. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us, what? From, the, from Adam? From the fathers? No, in Christ Jesus before the world began. I'd like to point out, you were not there. Right? You were not there. This idea that a covenant was made with you before you existed is kind of silly. Like, how's that? You don't even exist. But he's not making a covenant here. It's given. He creates a grace, creates a purpose, and says, I'm going to give this to everybody after I get to a point here in my covenant program. I'm going to reveal, I'm going to purpose this before the world began. He says in verse 10, but it's now may manifest. See, God had purposed the timing here. It's now may manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. The appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ is not Advent season. Advent means appearing or coming. And so the Advent season is people looking for the coming of Jesus, though he's already come. They like to remember what it was like before Jesus was here in the flesh, in anticipation of the Son of David coming, right? So that's what they're saying they're doing in the Advent. Uh, not, not to consider that his birth wasn't really more important than his death and resurrection. Paul says here that the manifestation of God's hidden purpose was revealed at the appearing of Jesus Christ, not in a manger, right? He said he abolished death. He didn't do that in a manger. He hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. That means it's after his death and after his resurrection. When was this purpose revealed? After his death, after his resurrection. Look at verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher. Now, wait a minute. Paul wasn't even a believer when Jesus died and rose from the dead. So Paul says, the appearing of Jesus Christ after his death and resurrection to me. Jesus appeared in Acts 9 to the Apostle Paul. You understand this? Like, we think about Jesus appearing in liturgical churches about his birth. That's not it. Paul discounts that. Or, okay, well, maybe it's him coming from the dead again after he died. Well, yeah, he kind of appeared again. I mean, he rose from the dead. He was there. The people saw him. But Jesus, Paul's talking about his appearing from heaven to make him a minister. You forget that Jesus came back. Not according to prophecy. And so in verse 10... I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And so he suffers these things because he knows the purpose that God's given him. This mystery concerned a new creature, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not concerning Jew or Gentile distinction, or a nation, or, the, or, or David's house forever, or the circumcised people. Right? What is it concern? This mystery changes how we view the rest of the scripture. Again, this is where people get confused. They, they say, well, we know how Paul's epistles are part of the Bible, and we know what God's purpose is to see souls saved through Christ. And so they go back and they 
reinterpret the scripture, and that's not really wrong to do in light of the mystery. When you get new information, you've got to go back and review what you knew before to see how that changes it, right? But what they tend to do is they go back and reinterpret and then remove the promises and covenants. Like, oh, no, he didn't mean a nation. He didn't mean an actual house on the earth. Well, no, he did. But we do learn things. In the light of what we now know, we go back and read the covenants and say, hey, that's Jesus. And that's Jesus, and that's Jesus, and Joseph's a type of Jesus, and Adam's a type of Jesus, and we start seeing that he's not just the center of the earthly program, he's the center of everything, right? He's not just above all the nations on the earth, he's above all principality and power, right? His bruising Satan wasn't just so that he can reign on the earth, his bruising Satan was so that there would be nothing against humanity for eternity, like to deal with sin and death, right? So we go back and as we've been learning the last four or five weeks, and we, we learn about Adam, where Adam was promised a seed of the woman would bruise the head of Satan, right? And we learn it's not just about the seed of the woman, though it is about the seed of the woman. I mean, we need Jesus Christ right here, man of heaven in the flesh, born of Virgin Mary. We need that. We need him. But we learn through Paul, as we talked about, that Adam teaches us about the fall of humanity, and in one man we all sinned, so that in one man we can all be saved. So it teaches us about reconciliation. We learn from Adam, not just the coming seed, but the message, let me draw it up here, the message of reconciliation. And this is precisely the ministry Christ gives us today, right? He's given us the word of reconciliation. That he's not imputing sins of the world, and that we're reconciling the whole world. Now, is that just one nation? Is that through one nation? Is that by the circumcised people? Well, no, it's the whole world. It's like there's no distinction, because there's no distinction with Adam either. It's like the whole world is in him. So in Christ, we have the message of reconciliation. We learn from Adam something. We learn from Abraham. Like I said, even though he was promised a nation above the nations, we learn through light of what the mystery is that we have righteousness by faith without works. And Paul goes back, remember Abram? The promise he was given? It was without works. He was given it to him by faith only. And so we learn. It's this message of faith alone. Now notice, reconciliation of faith alone are lessons learned outside of the law. In fact, another lesson we learn. Are you under the law of Moses? No. My illustration hopefully communicates this as well. You're not under the law of Moses. You're beyond it. How can you be beyond God's law? Well, the fact that the law isn't sufficient to save anybody, the law can't perfect us, the law can't bring in what needs to happen in a new creation, we're crucified with Christ, so we're not under the law. That would be a lowering of your standard, right? You're in Christ by grace. But we learn from Moses something, which is what? We're not under the law. We're dead to it. But we're not without service. People who want the law to remain on you are confused by that statement. If we're not supposed to keep the law, what are we supposed to do? Like, if we're not supposed to keep the law, then there is no service. Well, no, no, there's a way to serve God without the law of Moses. Like, there's a way to serve your spouse without me dictating to you what you ought to do. Like, out of love, maybe? Like, out of grace, maybe? Like, like naturally from your heart, maybe? That would be a way to serve God according to how he's revealed his will, right? What he desires. Don't you respond to each other that way? You figure out their desires, and if you love them, you do them. Right? Well, that's a big if, and that requires a lot on you, perhaps. But it's service that's genuine and honest and sincere and changes your heart, and it's not required by a law. You're not under the law. The new covenant would change your heart, but it changes the heart by giving you the Holy Spirit and causing you to keep the commandments. That's different. There's only 613 commandments of the law. We covered this two weeks ago. Right? There is innumerable ways to love each other and love God. Jesus even said, all the law is summed up in love God and love your neighbor. Right? And so we learn from Moses that no man can do it, that we're all sinners, that the knowledge of sin, and that we can serve God without it, because we're now servants of righteousness, not because we serve the law, but because we serve Christ. He is the righteousness. Right? So we're servants not because of a covenant made with us, but because we're in him. Right? We learn from David in 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, David was promised a seed that his house would be reigning on the earth forever. Well, we're not David's house, 
But Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Remember we covered with the seed of David and how inherent in that covenant was resurrection? The son of David, this is forever, would have to be a resurrected son, right? Well, that was fulfilled in Jesus when he resurrected from the dead. But what was not known was that resurrection in Jesus is now going to be your resurrection since you're in Christ. Jesus rose from the dead not just to be the king of Israel, but according to Paul's gospel, that everyone else can have that power in them. Right? That's why Paul says he rose from the dead according to my gospel. There was something about that that was not known. Something about his death that wasn't known. Something about his resurrection that wasn't known. Something about Jesus that wasn't known. And that's this mystery of Christ. This body of Christ. We learn from the fathers in circumcision. Do you have to be circumcised to be saved? Not in your flesh. You don't do anything to be saved. Colossians 2 says you're circumcised without hands. Philippians 3 says you're the circumcision that has no confidence in the flesh. The whole point of the circumcision was to have no confidence in the flesh. And we learn then from the fathers something different in light of what we now know. It's not that I guess we've got to do some work. No, we learn that flesh has no power and it's not, no, there's no confidence in it. We learn these things differently. You see then how preaching Jesus Christ according to the mystery is greater and more excellent than anything he's ever revealed before. All right? You also see how if you're preaching a gospel of the kingdom which harkens back to David's promise. He was promised a kingdom from his house forever. You're preaching about Israel and to Israel. If you're talking about a new covenant, that covenant's made with the house of Israel and house of Judah, 12 tribes, right? You're confining the message of Jesus Christ, to what he was doing to earth through one nation, right? Even if you go back to the fathers, <clears throat> which Paul does, and says, well, look, these fathers back here, we learn about faith and righteousness by faith and reconciliation. Even then, you go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What about people who are not of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Not everyone is from those guys. We learn a principle about righteousness by faith. You see, our message is not the gospel of the kingdom. Our message is not the gospel of the circumcision. You've heard that message before? Paul says Peter was given the gospel of the circumcision. Paul was given the gospel of the uncircumcision. The gospel of the circumcision goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, speaking to how the whole world gets blessed through the circumcised people. Right? We are not under that. There's something beyond it. Circumcision doesn't matter anymore, according to the mystery of Christ. Circumcision, uncircumcision, what avails is a new creature. That's what Paul says in Galatians 5. So whether you're circumcised, whether you're uncircumcised, it doesn't matter. What matters is a new creature. Doesn't that raise the new creature in importance? What's more important, your physical circumcision or your new creature? Well, new creature, according to Galatians 5. People would, have, would put us under, however, these covenants. If you put us under the covenants, you're making those more important than the mystery of Christ. And Paul says we should approve things that are excellent. On page 129, after chapter 10 in uh, Cornelius Stamp's book, Things That Differ, shamely named, by the way, it should be not things that differ, but things more excellent, He's, he's trying to quote and retranslate Philippians 1 when Paul says you should approve things that are excellent. And he makes that things that differ, trying to show the differences. Well, differences are good. But what differences do not do is explain the biblical truth of things that are more excellent. Okay? Are these different? Covenants and mysteries? Dispensation and covenant? Yes, those are different. Covenants to Israel, dispensation of grace to us, that's different. But one's more excellent than the other. And there's a relationship to that excellency. Right? Like these are good. The law of Moses is righteous, holy, and good. Promises are great. But what's greater than all of these things? God's eternal purpose. His manifold wisdom. It's more excellent. If you realize what's more excellent, then you realize what's most important. And you'll realize how it changes how you view everything of lesser importance. Right? We know this in our lives. If I talk to you about your eternal hope and your eternal salvation, and what matters is eternal glory, it changes how you view everything else of lesser importance. I have eternal glory coming to me. I guess mowing the grass looks different now, right? It's like not as important. You know, it's just one example. But everything under eternal glory is, changes its, your perspective on it. 
The same thing here. Your perspective on the rest of Scripture, the covenants given to Israel, the law given to Moses, the covenants given to David, changes in light of the more excellent mystery that's now been revealed and known to you. So don't fall into the trap of thinking, which I think unfortunately is created by things that differ. Right? Is that it's not just different, it's more excellent. Because that shows you the relationship to the rest of the Bible. People say, well, how do I learn from the rest of the Bible? Well, if they're different, I understand the question. Right? If you segregate, I understand the difference. You're over here, they're over there, don't touch. Well, how do I learn from that then? But if one is greater than the other, you know, being graduated from school is greater than not being graduated from school. Why? The idea is that you get educated to a point where you can somehow exist in society, right? This is this idea. So if you're uneducated, didn't graduate kindergarten, you're going to be at a disadvantage, right? If you go through school, learn how to read and write, you're going to have an advantage, right? This is the idea. It's something's more excellent. It's not that you don't learn anything in kindergarten. It's that there's something more excellent than that. You see, the law of Moses was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Paul says, points to Christ. But Paul's making the point, it's not Christ according to prophecy, it's Christ according to mystery. It's like knowing these covenants teaches us things that now is revealed, that was, was once secret. That now we see how God had purposed this since the beginning of the world, from the beginning, before the world. Like the whole Bible speaks to this. Like it it's not revealed, right? But it speaks to God's eternal purpose for heaven and earth. And we praise God for that. And it's not just us that God works through. He's going to work through Israel. He's going to work through the kingdom. He's, it's, it's everywhere. And how perfect that plan is. Right? How perfect this whole plan is. You see. So is Jesus still at the center? There's this debate between the covenantal theologians, dispensationalists, and the covenant theologians will say, well, we're Christocentric. It's all about Jesus Christ because all the covenants speak to him. And dispensationalists, they want to divide Israel from the church. Well, yes, there's divisions. See? But it's all about Jesus Christ. He's at the center of it all, not just on the earth, but above all things. Paul says he was lifted up by the power of God's resurrection above all things. Right? Complete, uh, Colossians 2.10 says you're complete in him above all principality and power in heaven and in earth. Wow, that's amazing. And so Ephesians 3 verse 18, Paul finishes up the knowledge of this mystery with this, this prayer that you might know and comprehend what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the width of the love of God. Remember that? Because it was once confined to a nation that you had to learn from, confined to a law that God gave, confined to an earthly kingdom that you had to go to. Not anymore. Right? In Ephesians 3, Paul says, I want you to comprehend the breadth of this thing, the depth of it, the height of it, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, be filled with the fullness of God. That's God's purpose for all time. Ephesians 4, verse 6, Jesus is at the center, and he's now above all, as Ephesians 4, 6 says, and he's through all, and he's in you all. Right? You could not say that under the covenants given to Israel. And now we can He's above all, through all, in you all. What a great mystery this is. And Paul says that. Ephesians 5. It's a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. It's more excellent. But there's a relationship to the covenants that we can learn from. Any thoughts? Questions?